out loud. All right. Chapter 3, beginning of verse 1. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under God. A time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to leave and a time to pass. A time to dance. A time to cast away. Okay, so thank you. We're going to look at this and try to put it in, in the context of um, which it lies and not try to just to poetize or make it something that it's not intended for. Remember, uh, the whole purpose in this book is looking for purpose on this earth or life under the sun, try to make some meaning of it. And, and as Solomon usually does, he begins each section like he began the whole book. He gives us his thesis and uh, his conclusion. <coughs> then he sets out to uh, prove it to be true. And that goes all the way back to chapter 1 where he says, Vanity, vanity. Everything is empty, worthless. It has no profit. That's his thesis. And then he's going now to prove it. And uh, <clears throat> the question that comes out of that, that naturally, what profit is there? For all the work that you do under the sun. Now, under the sun refers to what? Life on this earth without a view of God. Not eliminating God's existence, but just saying, if we were just to look at life here with no view of eternity, can you make any sense of our short time on this, this globe? And, of course, the answer is no. So we saw in the last couple of weeks this grand experiment. I just think this is fascinating, this experiment, where he's going to test pleasure, he's going to test wealth, he's going to test women, he's going to test projects, because he had the time, the resources, the wisdom, the, the money. He could do anything absolutely that he wanted. And he spent years in this experiment, and if it started in his 40s and now he's older, he spent much of his midlife you know, pursuing some type of satisfaction, something he could say, yeah, this makes me feel good, and I've, I've achieved something. But when it's all said and done, on each project, each adventure, what was his answer? Well, the f journey was fun, but this is not the answer. I mean, it doesn't fulfill. And so he's tested himself with pleasure, wisdom, folly, materialism. Jim Carrey, whether you like him or not, I thought this was an interesting quote. I think everyone should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can find it's not the answer. Uh, either he is a great grandchild of Solomon, or else he read Solomon, or life under the sun is the same for everybody. And again, if I just could have, then I'd be happy. And again, these two people, one hundreds of years ago, and one current says the same thing. No, it doesn't make you happy. It's not. You're going to have to look above the sun or actually look at the sun, Jesus Christ. So here in this section, we have this beautiful, it, it just cries for being inspired, isn't it? It, it? It's very poetic, but we have to break it down and look at it because we have this section where there's eight couplets of uh, things that are contrasted one with each other. So, uh, verse 2, you have a time to give birth and a time to plant. And now, there's something called Hebrew parallelism, and we've talked about that before. It's a form of poetry where you'll give one line, and the next line is the equivalent, but it's different. It's equivalent because it explains the first line. It expounds on it, all right? And so you can see that in the very first one. There's a time to give birth and a time to die. Well, there's a time to plant and a time to... So are those equivalent? A person's born, he dies, you plant, and then you pull up. Are they equivalent? 
those two lines. Yeah, we're planted on this earth and then we're uprooted, just like you plant a plant. So that's Hebrew parallelism that's going to help us understand some of the, the language here, okay? That there seems to be consistent. There's a couple ones that are tough, but if you have this kind of understanding, it'll help you. Now, also, what's the one word that jumps out at you more than anything? Time. And so the one thing that Solomon wants to press with you, time is everything. Time is God's tool, and we're subject to it, and you cannot master it. Because time keeps on clicking, and you have no control, really, of time whatsoever, right? The only thing you can do is buy up the time. That's what Paul says. Redeem it. Take advantage of the opportunities. But time just keeps going, and everything has a purpose, and that's what he's going to try to see. Now, some say this has a dark feel to it. Well, it does, because there's this monotony, right? Time, just click, 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 like a, a metronome on the the piano can you stop the clicking no and just you want to say time out can we just catch up and rest no the clock what just keeps clicking you have no control and it's monotonous because these cycles continue but is that the purpose but one of the keys we're going to see is to embrace the events of time rather than try to fight them and so he's going to give us some of his wisdom now that he's learned of life under the sun. And, and it's about embracing life's events, even though some of them are not pleasant. So let's look at this, uh, this uh, uh, first verse, first of all. When he says, there is an appointed time for everything. Everything. Now, in this list, we're going to have some good things and some bad things. But there's a pointed time for everything, and there is for every event under heaven, a time for every event. So everything comes in its order. Now, when you think about it, um, when would is the best time to invest in the stock market in the last 10 years? Well, it's beginning of the last president's inauguration, because it's just... Whoops. Now, would you want to invest it last Friday when it dropped 600 points? That's not, time means everything, isn't it? All right? Is there a time to uh, tell a joke? Is the punch, can some people tell jokes really well? I mean, I was really killing them at men's breakfast. So, <laughs> yeah, people are going, that was lame, Jack. That, but time means everything, isn't it? You know, and... Uh, Timing as far as uh, rebuking someone or going to them, is there time to do that and there time not to? You know, at the bottom, when they're broken and they see their own shame, is that the time to get on them or is that the time to lift them up? All right? So it's very important. When you're cooking meat on a barbecue, is timing important? Too long and it's too dry and too short and it's too raw. All right? And some people have that skill to cook really well on a barbecue, right? And it's other people, you don't want to touch the meat, okay? So uh, time means everything. So here I want you to see in this text, time is used 30 times, <laughs> okay? No pun there. Um, first of all, there's no judgment on any of the things he's going to mention. He doesn't give any judgment when he says there's a time to kill and a time uh, to heal. There's no judgment attached to it. He just says, when you look at life, these are real events, and everyone, what does he say? It's appointed. Everything's appointed. God is in charge of time. There is an appointed time. So when they come and click around, is that just like, no, this is not supposed to happen now. This is wrong. What does he say? No, it's pointed. God's in charge. And for us to have a good life on this earth and, and make the most of it, we have to embrace these moments, the good and the bad, and find some life lessons or purpose in them so we can move through them. Because in as much as you resist them and fight them, you're fighting the tick of the clock, and who's going to lose that battle? We are. That's why a lot of people are miserable, because this is not fair. Why me? And that kind of thing, all right? So there's no judgment given. They're just going to happen. 
Uh, God's in charge of them. And this is one that's, that's hard. Every event under heaven. Under heaven's another uh, phrase for what? Life under the sun. Okay, you got that. Good. The word event actually means something delightful or pleasurable or a, a moment of pleasure. When you look at that, and that's in the Hebrew, and I checked it to make sure, um, every event has something that you can delight in. Now, some of these things are going to be negative. And like, what? You can find some pleasure in it? Now, we're mindful, perhaps, of what Paul said in Romans 8. Sometimes you suffer so much that when you groan, you don't even know what to say to God in your prayers. But that's okay. The Spirit intercedes and... He translates your groanings into words for God. But the next sex paragraph says, God causes, can anyone finish it? All things to work out for good for those who love him. So there's going to be benefit in everything because who's in charge? God is. So when he says there's no judgment, so we shouldn't judge them. This is bad and should never happen. Uh, God's in charge. Embrace the events as they come and look for the purpose, the pleasure, the some life lessons you can learn. Now, if we could do that, we're going to be moving with the flow of time rather than against it. So with that being said, let's look at uh, the things that we read. Um, I'll look on the board rather than read them again because we already read them. But here's the first couplet. There's a time to uh, give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to be uprooted. Now, these are the bookends of life, right? They're the parameters of your habitation on this earth. It's the moment you are born, and then there's the moment you die. And the only thing we have in between is what we call life. It's those, those few days on this earth that we get. And that, that's the reality. There's nothing you can do to enlarge it or shorten it, or whatever. Well, I guess you could take your life, I guess. But just like a plant is planted, and then it has its life cycle, and then it dies like weed in the field, and we pluck it up to eat it or whatever, or discard it. Now, there are the bookends. Um, some would suggest that God has appointed the day of your death. Now, I'm not sure if that's the case. But does God know the day of your death? Is there a difference? One's called foreknowledge. He's aware of things. The other one's is he's already destined you to die in a certain day. No, I don't know if there's any indication in Scripture that says that, and you can help me if there is. But, uh, but God certainly knows, doesn't he? And can you circumvent that day of your death when it happens? No. The only two people that I'm aware of that got out without dying are Elijah and, and Jonah. I mean, um, Enoch. <laughs> Jonah. Okay? So... There are the bookends. So birth and death, as Wright says, are the boundaries of life. We're all subject to them. It's interesting. In the world, four... What? Four persons. A, one person is born every second in the United States. In the United States. And then one person dies every 11 seconds. In the world, it's four persons are born every second in the world and 1.8 or almost two people die every second in the world does this does this first sentence of uh solomon bear true we see it all around us and that's helpful because we're going to get later it's better to go house of mourning because the living take it to heart because it's the end of all people i'm talking about a funeral now, we have a society that often now today is trying to sterilize death, not deal with it. There is no service. We don't want to look at it because it scares us. But there's some value in just embracing your life is coming to end. And if you're 16 or you're 60, you better think about it today and not then and not run from a scare because it's appointed <laughs> and there's a purpose behind it. Yes. Okay, yeah. Well, 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I'm going to agree with you, but I, you might take that. It's when you do die, it's been appointed that you die, but the day of your death, has it been appointed by God? But See what I'm saying? It matter, no, it doesn't. Time no, it doesn't. It, in the end, it doesn't. It, it doesn't. And so you're exactly right. Because uh, God knows, and it's going to happen. All right? That's right. That's right. Now, now, with that being said, if we just think about the day of our death all the time, what, what's going to happen to your life? Well, you're going to be depressed. You're going to have problems, aren't you? But it, should it be a guiding principle in your life? Someday I'm going to die. It should because it's going to chal- or ch- uh, set a perspective that you must have to live a good life and live uh, a life with God which is a lot longer than life on this earth. So he says now there's a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up. Again, I would suggest these are parallel, a time to kill. This is not the word used in the Ten Commandments, thou shall not kill. That should be translated, thou shall not murder. Is the Bible full of killing for right reasons? Yes, and you cannot miss that. That's why this is not a peace anthem, you know, that was to protest the Vietnam War, because in that song it says what? There's a time to kill. There is a time to kill. Now, like, people don't like to talk about um, uh, capital punishment because, well, for various reasons, but I'll just say from a scriptural point of view, God not only approved of it, he commanded it. He values life so much, so highly, that you are created in his image. When someone takes your life without cause, that's murder, right? Without cause, unjustified. God says that person has to give up their life because he values life that much. And that's the premise for which uh, capital punishment exists. It's justice, an eye for an eye and tooth for tooth. And Solomon's just acknowledging that. There is a time to kill, but then there's a time to what? Heal. There's sometimes you don't put a person to death. You restore them and you, re, you know, rebuild them. And that's why he says the second one, sometimes you tear things down, but then sometimes you build them up. Sometimes you tear down kingdoms or powers or people because they got, they're too much of this. And then sometimes you build up people's lives. He's not talking about just projects and buildings, even though that could be, why would you tear down walls? Well, if you're in their day. Well, that'd be one reason, but it's also to attack a city, right? Because you're going to kill. Did they do a lot of killing and attacking enemies in Solomon's, you know, that era? Yeah, they're always having to fight their enemies. But then there's a time to build up for protection. Yes. Yeah, tear them down. They do in the military. Obviously, they're recruiting. What do they do? They break them down. That's right. Build them back up in the way they want to see them. So we could uh, make life applications to lots of areas of our life, but the primary one's about life and death here, isn't it? There's a time to kill, and there's time not to kill. Okay? Um, It doesn't mean cap uh, murder, as we said. Um, A time to weep and a time to laugh. I saw these pictures of a little baby because it captures... Just all of us. You know, at one moment in life, you can just be, hey, everything's great. And then the very next moment, because of news or something happens, you can just go from tears of joy to tears of great sorrow. Just like that, right? And babies do it that quickly, don't they? From, <laughs> right? And we're just grown children is all we are. Um, it's interesting, it's been said, if you don't learn to laugh at trouble, then you won't have anything to laugh at when you grow old. Now, I'm not old yet, but I hear it from others. that When you get older, you have lots of troubles, don't you? And I think that's a wonderful statement. It is, you have to embrace the times to cry because it's an appointed time to cry. Some people have the stiff upper lip, especially at a funeral, because I'm not going to let anyone see me cry. I just... 
for whatever reason. That wasn't the case in the days of the Jews. They were great mourners. They would wail. They would rip their clothes and, and protest if it was something. They knew how to express themselves. And mourning or grieving is a gift of God. He gave us tear ducts, not just to lubricate the eyes, but to help vent the, this emotions that are pent up in us, so much so that when Jesus was at the funeral of his good friend Lazarus, what does this text say, the two short, uh, the shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept. Jesus wept. There is a time to cry. Yeah. But with that crying, it's also a cause of healing. Yeah. That's why we do it. Right, that's right. It's healthy, all right? It's how we uh, go through grief. So, uh, but there's also a time to laugh because if all you do is crying, oh, woe is me and woe is life and woe is everything around me, you're going to have a sorrowful, depressing life. Is there a time to just rejoice and have fun? But is it the time to laugh and goof off at a funeral? Now, some people, do they not know the appointed times for things. And they just are really antisocial because they have social problems. Because <laughs> they don't understand the timing's important, right? Okay? And so, like in a service like this, sometimes we tell jokes, but sometimes it's not appropriate, is it? Timing is everything. But you have to embrace both because there's a time to mourn and there's a time to dance. These go together, right? Because you would dance at a wedding, but you would mourn at a funeral, all right? So again, uh, both are part of life. Oh, I, this is an interesting phrase. Without one, the other is recognizable. Unrecognizable. Isn't that what I said? <laughs> Time, words are important, too. <laughs> if you didn't have the great sorrows in your life, would the joys be as, as high? Does that make sense? You know... It, and without the great joys, it makes the sorrows even more sorrowful. And that's the way it is. I remember, and some of you the parents, you bring in your kids to, to services, getting people ready. It's like, why do I even bother? Because no one even wants to go to worship today or class. And why even bother? You just get frustrated because nothing goes right this morning. When you finally get here, and you sing the songs, you pray to God, it's something said from his word that just touch you and just lifts that spirit from way down there to way up there. And you go, afterwards, that's why I went. Right? From that great time of struggle and sorrow to great joys. And that can happen just like that. I don't know how many times I've said, and I've heard you say, I didn't want to go, but I'm sure glad I did. Right? It happens over and over and over. All right? So then he goes, a time to throw stones, a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, and a time to shun embracing. This one's difficult because if they're parallels, the first and the second are coupled together, all right? So is throwing stones just throwing stones, and then is it collecting them, or is throwing stones mean something else, okay? So um, the second one, if it is a parallel, it's going to help us. There's a time to embrace, then there's a time not to embrace. So when would they maybe throw stones in that day? When you put somebody to death because the Lord commanded it all the time with regard to any sin that all right. was done intentionally, they were taken outside the gate of stone. So it's judgment, okay, when you're stoning someone. Well, then why would there be a time to gather stones? So they can build a wall. All right, so it's not to kill or destroy, maybe it's to build up, all right? But then it says embrace and not embrace. Some have said, and, and there's a lot of debate on this, and actually the New English translation, I think it's that one, says gathering stones is a figure of speech used for sexual intimacy in a relationship. And that's why it parallels there's a time to embrace and not a time to embrace. There's time to gather stones and or throw stones and now, if you do some work on it, you'll find that, yeah, a lot of people say that's the case. It's not clear that's it, but it seems perhaps to be best more of judgment, throwing stones or building up. There's a time to embrace people, and there's a time to shun embracing. It's a difficult one. This, this couplet, a lot, a lot of us written about it, and they're not sure what it means. But we know there is a time for both, all right? 
if it is the sexual world, men need to listen up. There's a time for it, and there's a time that it's not appropriate, right? Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 7, that don't deprive each other except for a time or a season for prayer and fasting. But then rejoin yourself to each other afterwards. So he even acknowledges there's a time for not having that type of intimacy. So a uh, time to search and a time to give up is lost. <laughs> My wife, are you she here? I don't see her. She's helping someone here. Oh, okay. Because uh, that's her purse. <laughs> she has everything in her purse. I, if I want it, I just ask her. She says, oh, yeah, I got that. Do you have a screwdriver? Oh, yeah. <laughs> a hammer? Yeah. <laughs> How about a ladder? <laughs> Comes out. <laughs> All right. But no, Band-Aids, whatever. Aspirin and everything. But this is a, a scripture that authorizes garage sales. Okay, it does. There's a time to search for things that you lost, and there's a time just to move on. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. There's a time to keep things, and there's a time to throw them away. Aren't we in constant flux of gathering and getting rid of stuff? And, and life's trying to find that balance between the two. It is a mental illness, she said, if you just keep, keep, and don't give away. Now, but isn't that natural? You get clothes and you gather clothes, and after a while they wear out, and so you get rid of them, all right? And, or else you donate them. And it, even if they're not wore out, people, what powers the goodwill stores? People taking this to heart. It's time to get rid of stuff. I hear my wife say that. It's time. It's just time to get rid of stuff, all right? That's why we call it spring cleaning. As you get older, it's like every month cleaning, you know, all right? That's right. That's right. That, that's a good answer. It's not a stuff a room. It's a car room, right? All right, so we see that, but it's appropriate to embrace it. It's time to keep this. It's important. But then there's a time to get rid of it. And if, if you can't embrace both of them, you're going to be tied. Uh, this one book that Anne has talked about decluttering, what clutter does to your life, it ties you to the past and does not allow you to live your future. Because you're tied to your past. And you say, well, that's deep and that's philosophical. But it's true. There's a time to get rid of stuff, rid of garbage in your life internally, emotional baggage, whatever. And so you can move on. Because as long as you keep on the hold on the past, you're stuck in the past. Even though that's not exactly what he's talking about. It, that, there's application there. There's a time to tear apart and a time to sew together. So you go to uh, Africa or the Philippines or anywhere... They don't have the opportunity to shop at stores like we do for clothing because they don't have the clothing. They don't have the money always. So what do they do? Like they used to do here in the States, then mend things, mend them, mend socks, mend, you know, I used to go to school with patches on my pants. We were that poor, and that's what we did. Now it's a fad, <laughs> all right? But is there a time you mend it no more and you just throw it away? He said, that's it. There's no, just get, you're done. Get rid of it. So tear it apart. There's a time to be silent and a time to speak. So if this is a parallel, um, what would verse, the first line mean if there's a time to be silent and a time to, be, to speak? Well, yeah, that's right. But what does this time to sow and a time to tear apart have to do with speaking? I want you to look back at the first line and make sense of it out of the second line. Do you follow me? All right, our words can sew relationships together or they can tear them apart. And is there a time to sever relationships? Yes. yes. Sometimes people are toxic in our life and it's time to walk away. Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before the swine. But on the other hand, he says, every careless, this scares me, every careless word you speak, you'll give an account of. Every one. And that's all of us individually, but a guy that speaks a lot, that's even more scary because I usually don't regret what I didn't say. I always regret what I did say. Is that not the case with all of us? 
Now, there are times in, at the end of like a lesson, I go, oh, I forgot to put in the main point. Now, you don't know I missed it, but you said oh, it was an okay lesson. But I, sometimes I regret it, but I do regret the stupid things I do say to people or from the pulpit or whatever. You can't take them back. There's a time to be silent, and there's a time to speak. Uh, slow to speak or, and quick to uh, hear. James says that, right? Um, there's a point in time to love and a time to hate. Now, everyone's going to embrace the first one, a time to love, but Solomon says also there's a point in time and it's appropriate to hate. That's right. That's right. And yet everyone does hate certain things universally. Like racism is a big topic always. They hate it. Is it appropriate? Can you love uh, acceptance in uh, racial equality if you don't hate racism? See, they come together, don't they? All right? Yes. That's right. There's a time to go to war, and then there's a time for peace. And if you're just to have this warring king, and all he wants to do is go to war and war, your, your, your country's in trouble. But is there time to go to war? And a lot of people don't understand that. They think you need to pacify and talk about everything. And come. But no, there's a time to go to war, but then there is a time for peace. And going to war is the last thing you should do. Now, this is a king talking, and he has to deal with it. So we on the bottom side don't even understand the information our government understands, do we? We have no idea the information they have and what they're going through and what decisions they have to make. So we look at it, and it's easy to make judgments. But here it just says there is a time for both. Yes? Take it to the spiritual level. We are at war with Satan. Constantly. And we should hate sin. That's right. Exactly. So see all these couplets. 30 times it uses the word time. And what are we to make out of this? What kind of sense? It's interesting, he goes right back to the question he started the whole book. What profit is there in life? Because this clock just keeps tipping, ticking, and there's these cycles, of, you know, joy and sadness, and a reaping and sowing, and living and dying, and speaking and being quiet, throwing stones and gathering stones. And it just goes on and on, and, and it just never stays the same. It's always, what's the profit? To the worker from which he toils. He says, I've seen the task which God has given the sons of men. And he says later, it's grievous. So where's the happiness in life if these events are pleasurable? Isn't that what it says? When you embrace them. So that's the question he's asking. Jesus asked the same uh, kind of thing himself. What does a man profit if he gains the whole world? But the idea is profiting. If, if you're looking for happiness in stuff and you forget the eternal, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Because the answer is, it profits you nothing. And that's what Solomon's saying. By asking the question, the answer, there is no profit long term. Long term. Yes. Yeah, it's rhetorical. Yeah, we already know the answer. There is no prophet, because that's his thesis, and he's just bringing us back to it. And it's sarcastic in as much as what? Well, it does profit what we do, what we toil. Um, every action in those preceding comments are something that we do. We interact in that. We make it happen. So what we do really is critically important. And that's what he's going to address next. But when you take a big picture at it, you go through all this and you just die. <laughs> Your life on this earth seems meaningless, is what he's saying. But then how are you going to find joy in the moment when those things are going on? And I think that's what he's going to address. Because they are important. They shape your life and they shape who you are. Yes? I was going to say, in every one of those questions, the key is wisdom. That's right. And that wisdom comes if you go back to God's word. He tells you when you should be joyful and you should be sad. He has laid it all out for us. 
That's right. And some of it's just learned through life itself. That's why he said in chapter 2, wisdom always exceeds over folly. You know, the fool, he doesn't get in this. He never asks the question, when should I be silent and when should I talk? He never even considers that. He just, right? <laughs> yes. All through Deuteronomy, God tells the children of Israel, if you keep my judgments and walk in my statutes, yes. yes. That's your, right. Uh, your livestock, all that your hand goes to do, I will bless, and I will prolong your days, and you will find joy and happiness. That's the joy that God wants. And he's going to mention that. So let's read verse 11 um, through 15, and we'll try to finish there. Because he introduced God back in the picture in verse 10. I've seen the task which God has given man. So now we're putting God back in this discussion. You with me? He, that's God, has made everything appropriate in its time. What does your Bible say other than appropriate? And that is probably an appropriate translation. (laughs) Rather than appropriate, beautiful. God's made everything beautiful because it harkens back to the where I said everything, event under the heaven, it has its appointed time. Event means what? Desirable or pleasurable. God is saying, Solomon's saying, God has made everything that comes with time in your life, the sorrow, the sadness, the joy, the death, the birth, everything is beautiful if you just slow down and embrace it rather than fight it and find its beauty and its purpose, Okay. He has also set eternity in their heart. So that no man will find out the work which God has done from the beginning, even to the end. That's a huge phrase there, and we'll come back and talk about it. He set eternity in your heart. I know there's nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor, this is the gift of God. We'll talk about that. I know that everything God does will remain forever. There's nothing to add to it. There's nothing to take from it. For God is so worked that men should fear him. There's the third lesson. That which has already been or, or has been already and that which will be has already been. For God seeks what has passed by. So let's try to make some sense of these statements. This first one is very profound. He's made everything beautiful as time. And he set eternity in your hearts. What does that mean, he set eternity in your heart? I think it's Blaise Pascal says, there's a God-shaped vacuum in all of us. And it's in the heart of every man. And it can't be filled, filled by anything physical or temporal, but only by God or Christ himself. And he's appealing to this idea of he set eternity in your heart. And best understood, and I think we are all could tune into this, we know intuitively that everything we've just read is true. There's a point in time to be born, and there's a time to die. And as the clock ticks, we all are, if we're honest with ourselves and don't run from it, we're aware that we're going to die. Our time is limited on this earth. So while we're here, we're trying to make sense of things. We're trying to make the best use of the time. We're trying to, to, to have some profit and some benefit. So we're trying to figure everything out, all these cycles and the highs and the lows and the war and the peace. And there he says, man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning to the end. There's some things you're never going to figure out. Because it's just like man, if he figures out the system, what will he do? He'll play the system, Right? And who's in charge of time and life's events that are pleasurable or pointed in their time? God is. Now, if we could know the day of our death, for example, what would many people do? If you knew in 2042, on September 18th, you were going to die, what would a lot of people do? September 2042? Yeah. What would you, you knew you're not going to die until then. That's your appointed day of death. What would you do right now? A lot of people. Huh? They, 
Less. less. What do you mean less? A lot of people go to what they want to do. That's it. Party hard. They'd party hard. Do what they want because they know they got time. Right? And so now I can do what I want because I'm in control because I know the time because I've got it figured out. Because I know there's eternity in my heart and I've got to prepare some time for the eternal. But right now I've got time. Here he says, God has not let you know the timing events so you don't play games with him or with life. That you learn to fear him, that's where we're going, rather than just be in charge yourself. Heather? If people were to do that, I think a lot of people would spend time in jail. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to jail, but it wouldn't be as annoying because they... Well, that's true. They say that they did whatever they wanted. <laughs> but if they knew they're not going to die, they would still follow some rules to stay out of jail, hopefully, right. But, yes... Right. Right. That's right. That's right. Yes. That's right. Before, that's right. And then try to rush it, rush through. That's right. Thing. They go, oh, I know when that's going to be, so I'm going to yeah. put that off and do what I want. That happens. It does. This idea of his eternity, I, I want you to grasp it. Everyone intuitively recognizes there's more to life than just what we have here. There's something going to happen later. I just want to figure it out now. And God has made it so you're not going to figure it out. You need to follow him rather than your own will. Uh, they, uh, uh, Bobby Miller was just telling a story about a guy at work. He's in his 50s, had the flu. It just wasn't going away. He didn't want to go to pneumonia. Went to the doctor last week Thursday. They said, you need to get uh, some imaging done. They found a huge growth on his liver. He says, go to home and set your life in order. you got days. He died Friday. All right? Did, was he in control of his life at all? That day's coming. So I got to finish real quick. Can you hold? Yeah, I'm out of time. <laughs> time. <laughs> all right. Um, don't fight life's events, but embrace the lessons learned. It's going back to what to you, all you've been saying. Since you don't know when it's going to happen, what has happened, when the, these things come, the sorrows, the joys, the the war, the peace, embrace it and learn something from them. When you go to a funeral, you learn to love life more fully because you know your day's coming, right? When you go to a wedding, hopefully it makes you think of your spouse and how valuable, important that is. All these things, we can learn something from them. Uh, real quickly, then we're done. Uh, it's nothing better to rejoice and do good in one's lifetime, to eat and drink. In other words, enjoy the blessings when they come and don't feel guilty about it. He says, this is what? The gift of God. And so don't fail to enjoy what is because you, you're too concerned or you're scared of what's going to happen. Yeah, the war is going to come. The economy is going to drop someday. There's going to be death. There's going to be disease. But don't let that so scare you, you can't enjoy today. There's a lot of people who have that problem. All right, the third thing he says, is, the secret here is don't fear life. But who? Fear who? Fear God. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. God's in charge, and he made every event beautiful if you'll just find the beauty in it. Don't fear life. Yeah, bad times are going to come, but you'll get through them. That's a promise, right? And someday you won't get through it, and you'll die. But that's okay, too, because that's beauty. You get to go to heaven. Fear God. Don't fear life. Thank you. I wish we had more time.